Oh my gosh, there she is. So many people reached out to me and said, are you going to talk to Dahlia? And I said, I, I hope so. I'm working on it. And before I could reach out to her, I got a message from you. I am so happy to see you. And congratulations. I'm holding the cover of the book and I peeled it off the book. It's so awesome. Look at the blurbs. You're amazing. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate that exuberance. Holy cow. That is, that's what I pay for. Yep. Well, <laughs> Uh, you know, this is this book. I'm very exuberant and inspired by this book because it puts a lot of things in one place for me and it helps me organize my thoughts about, frankly, the way ahead, the way forward. I saw your interview with the great Michelle Goodwin at Politics for Pros, and she said that in case people don't know, she's a black woman. She talked about the, the era of Jim Crow and she referred to this era she said, I call it Jane Crow. And I wanted to start by saying your new book, Lady Justice, Women in the Law and the Battle to Save America, is doing a lot for me and even more than what Michelle Alexander, for Jane Crow, than what Michelle Alexander's uh, book did for the new Jim Crow, which changed my entire view on things. That's the way I'm feeling about Lady Justice. So it, it's really important. Why do you think this, why did you write this book about this situation we're in now? Well, first of all, thank you. That's unbelievably generous. Um, you know, I, I would say this, we're all of us watching what's happening in Iran right now. Mm. And we're obsessed with, I don't know about you, but I, my husband and I, for years now, have been obsessed with like photographs of women in Iran from the 70s, right, where they're wearing bell bottom jeans, and they're wearing like wedge heels and no hijab, because it's such a reminder that even though one wants to believe it was ever thus, it was not in fact ever thus, right? Clerics took control and suddenly you could be killed uh, under custody of the morality police for not wearing your headscarf correctly. And I, I start there only because I think it's a useful and bracing reminder that this happens, right? It's not that, oh, you know, one day you have freedom and uh, the next day you don't is a thing that we can't Imagine, go ahead, everybody, and Google, you know, photographs of women in Iran in the 70s. And, and so I start there because when I compare and contrast what I'm seeing happen in Iran this week and last week, the protests, with what I'm seeing happen in the United States post Dobbs, I think that we make a category error when they, we say it's the same thing. Because we actually do have the force of law in this country. We do have the capacity to affect change at the voting booth. We do have the capacity to talk meaningfully about court reform. We do have the capacity to do something about gerrymandered state houses. Now, I don't want to suggest for a minute that, um, you know, those things are easy the fixes that I'm talking about, right. but we have access to them. And so I think part of the reason this book is important to me is that I get very frustrated, Pete, when people say, you know, oh, you know, women have their voices and women, you know, are organizing and women are, no, women have real power. Like they have badass, huge technical skills to litigate and win, to organize and win. And this is a book that's a tribute to women and power, not just our voices, our ability to organize and go to protest. That's essential. And I don't want to in any way downplay that. But that's what we're seeing in Iran. And it's chilling. In this country, we're not that. We have the ability to say, you know what, we could add four seats to the court tomorrow. You know what? If we want to focus in on state races and elect a state attorney general who wants to protect women's privacy, we could do that tomorrow. And so I guess part of what I'm trying to do is insert into this conversation about, you know, vulnerable, uh, uh, not just women, you know, because it's a book also about migrants and immigrants and refugees, but that vulnerable communities are not without power. And that's important. So well said. I mean, you mentioned Iran and religion. I was so impacted. I remember where I was when I read, I'm sure it was the cover story at New Republic uh, that you wrote about uh, Orthodox women and how they're treated in certain uh, very conservative parts of Israel where you lived, I think, for like a year and wrote that story. And I feel like in reading Lady Justice, the, the common thread throughout many of the the issues and the women that you document is religion 
being pushed upon them. I mean, you can I can mention it probably in some way, in some connection to, to, to many of these cases. How important do you think the kind of extreme right Christian nationalism is to America, as you mentioned, the religious issues in Iran or Israel or anywhere else? I mean, I think it's important. And I know you and I have talked about this historically. It's also really hard to talk about, right? I mean, I think one of the lessons we took from the Amy Coney Barrett hearing was the utterly in, inadequate and I would say hopelessly addled attempt to question her <laughs> on her, you know, whether her religious views would inflect on her uh, doctrine and her judicial decisions. And I think it's really a complicated question. But I do think that when you have um, a Supreme Court that is by every measure the most religious court ever in the history of the country and the most explicitly religious court. And then you have people like Justice Alito in the wake of Dobbs going to Rome to spike the football and make claims about how the mm -hmm. most persecuted minority uh, in this country are uh, religious people. I, I think we have to talk about it. And so one of the things that I think we need to do better at and it's not to make claims. I don't want to say all religious people, you know, put religion before doctrine or, um, you know, that 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 uh, it's easy to say which religious justices are not fit to be on the court. Those are really thorny, intractable questions. But I think refusing to talk about religion in the court is part of how we got into the situation in the first place. Well, it's so often used to empower men and keep men in power, though. I mean, specifically that and often held up by, unfortunately, women in power. But I think what you're saying throughout this book and what you kind of touched on here was the inspiring part. I guess the bad part is you you admit we are you acknowledge or even inform for people that don't believe it. We're in for it the rest of our lifetime. And the inspiring part is. But we have a lot of amazing people, including those you document in this book and who understand how to use the law, which women have a different understanding for. Could you tell me a little bit about your thoughts on how women are affected, maybe even generationally, by law so much that they have to have a better understanding of it to protect themselves? Uh, yes, with the caveat that, of course, this is a gross overgeneralization and, you know, essentializing in, in, in a deep way. But I think the book for me opens with crowds at Donald Trump rallies in 2016 chanting, lock her up, lock her up about yeah. Hillary Clinton. And, you know, at the time we were like, well, that's kind of annoying. It's kind of like those chants of iron my shirt. I get it. It's just rude. But my point was, I think it's much more than that, right? I mean, it is a promise. And Donald Trump kept performing that, that he wanted to use the force of his Justice Department to investigate her and to incarcerate her for crimes, which in the rearview mirror, Pete, are pretty tri trivial compared to his own. And so I think that Lock Her Up becomes a through line for me through the book. When we actually land after Dobbs, in a moment in which women are going to jail in Alabama and being kept there for endangering their pregnancies, women are going to jail in Oklahoma for endangering their pregnancies or for miscarriages. Women are being reported uh, for what look like suspect miscarriages around the country. And so I think that Lock Her Up goes from being kind of a like weird, creepy, polemical chant about using the machinery of the law to prosecute Hillary Clinton it's chanted at AOC. Yeah. It's chanted at Nancy Pelosi. It was chanted about Christine Blasey Ford. Lock her up at the end of the book is literally where we are, right? It is where we are. And um, it's not just abortion. As I said, it's pregnancy loss. It's miscarriage. It's uh, attempting to use uh, methotrexate, a cancer drug, which also um, can have the, the side effect of causing abortions. And so I think what I wanted to make material was that the law is both kind of the engine of great liberty and dignity and freedom for women and can be in a second weaponized to be the engine of their prosecution and incarceration. 
And this isn't just Margaret Atwood in The Handmaid's Tale. This is happening. And the point I wanted to make is that I think, and you're exactly right, that use of generational. I think we have it in our muscle memory, Pete. <laughs> like there is not so very long ago that women couldn't have a credit card, that a woman couldn't be raped by her own husband. Not so very long ago that women couldn't enter the legal profession. And so this stuff is not, it had to be like clawed by women over generations, this kind of power. And I just think that that, both that double-edged sword of the law as an instrument of oppression and an instrument of freedom, but also that sense that right now we are on the precipice of the law being used to harm women in deep and meaningful ways is something that's really visceral for women. Yes. And you write about it so beautifully. You, you mentioned the phrase lock her up. You also and folks, if lock her up wasn't enough, we, if you stay now for a limited time, there's send her back. I mean, they th it's the her. I think that's key. Uh, and you mentioned that in reference to the uh, chance about Representative Elon Omar. Uh, and but you also write in, in, in the introduction about what you just said, you write that yeah, every woman I interviewed, because you interviewed so many people, prominent people, scholars, and, and more for this book, even if she was a lawyer, judge, or law professor, heard in 2016's exuberant lock her up chants, the echoes of savagery, vigilantism, and abuse. It became a promise that the law was not going to protect us, but it could not would be used to punish. That meant that women in the age of Donald Trump in the years that followed wouldn't simply have to fight to preserve the rule of law. They would have to fight to keep the law itself from being used against them. When I talked to our friend Eric Siegel last night, he said, if anything, she is one. She is definitely the best writer. I'm very jealous of how great of a writer she is. And I think what I just read from your book exemplifies that. But the point, the, the larger point is just really an exclamation point on what you just said. I wanted to read that. And, and Eric has been just madly tweeting out chunk, chunks of the book and it's so uh, moving. And I would say he actually tweeted something and we can talk about the Me Too chapters if you want, but I yeah. think he was one of the very few people who understood that the, the material about Me Too and federal judges is about complicity. It's not about Me Tooing a single judge. So I, I'm so grateful that he tweeted out we all knew this about um, a particular federal judge, and we kept inviting him to our law schools. Yeah. Well, go ahead and speak more about complicity. I am very familiar with that word. I was warned about being complicit uh, my entire life by my older brother. He always said, don't be. And he would point to what that meant. And uh, and I think I have a good understanding of it, luckily, because I had a great couple of mentors. But you're talking about it in terms of so many people who have seen what happened and, and who didn't say anything. And you consider yourself one of these people. I think it's a, a harsh self-reflection. Nonetheless, you take an honest look at it and, and write intimately about it in the book. So what do you mean by being complicit and why does that matter? Well, just for listeners who are baffled at this point, I guess I'll just say that um, the, some of the chapters at the center of the book are about Me Too and the federal judiciary. And that is, um, some of that is Brett Kavanaugh and Christine Blasey Ford. And some of it is the former chief judge of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is one of the most powerful courts in the country, uh, Judge Alex Kaczynski. And the problem that I was trying to raise is that he had shown porn to his clerks. He had talked in really explicit sexual ways to his clerks. He had touched women inappropriately uh, who clerked for other judges. And this went on for years and years and years and years. And what I said in the book is that I knew about this from my own clerkship on the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and I kept that secret for decades. And I would sit next to him on panels and go to fancy dinners. Uh, he was a feeder judge. He was one of the federal appellate judges who absolutely could vault his own law clerks uh, onto the Supreme Court, right? And Brett Kavanaugh was a former clerk of his. And so I think that in 2017, when a few incredibly brave women, Heidi Bond and Emily Murphy, eventually a bunch of other women came forward and said, I am going to say this about him. He should not have lifetime tenure on the Ninth Circuit and should not be deciding cases that have to do with sexual assault and abuse. And when I f decided to write what I knew at the time, and I did, 
um, and it was excruciating. Uh, but one of the things that I wrote both in the piece that I wrote at the time and also in the book is that I had not fully thought about the fact that my keeping this a secret or just whispering to young women who were at law school, don't take that clerkship, don't take that clerkship, it's not worth it, um, was a piece of complicity. It was a, a choice to let him remain in power uh, because he was powerful and because he could do things for us. And that I didn't realize that, and I say this with great chagrin, what happened to Heidi Bond and Emily Murphy and Leah Lippman and the many of the other women in the book might not have happened uh, if I had stepped forward and, and written what I knew at the time. And maybe the final turn, and, and you can tell me what you think about this, is that what's most maddening about some of these Me Too experiences is that we then laud, right? We're like, oh, Christine Blasey Ford is a hero, or you know, Leah Lippman and Emily Murphy and Heidi Bond are heroes, uh, but we don't make them whole. And the judge goes on to have lifetime uh, tenure. And I think in a deep way, we are doing some of this Me Too stuff. In Judge Kaczynski's case, he did step down. But we do it in lieu of actual investigation and due process. And so it's a failure on all sides. It's a failure to do any kind of meaningful scrutiny of what uh, the claims were against both Judge Kaczynski and Brett Kavanaugh, but lifting up these women as heroes and saying, oh, I believe you, without doing anything to repair the systems is really cold comfort. Yes, cold comfort is the phrase. To say, I mean, it, I don't know how to put it any better than that, but basically, I mean, you, you put it in different ways in these kind of two chapters, Me Too and Her Too, that I think frame it uh, uh, pretty pretty well, which is that you have to have some kind of accountability. I think it's best uh, illustrated when, which senator was it? Was it Susan Collins that said, yes, I believe her, but, you know, I'm still, I'm still going to confirm Brett Kavanaugh. And so there has to be some kind of accountability. And that is what you're, and so many other people are demanding in these cases, or else we don't have any systemic or structural reform. And you continue to have people might, they might get shamed, they might have to resign, but they're still collecting their pension and they, they make their way back pretty quickly. They make their way back. And I quote in the book, Kathy Koo, who's another woman who came forward again at massive personal peril. She's mm -hmm. a formidable lawyer. And she said, if you don't have an investigation, you are just laying down tracks for them to rehabilitate themselves. And again, it's not just that it's unfair to, you know, the women who bear the burden of this. And it was overwhelmingly uh, women who came forward and spoke on the record about Judge Kaczynski, it's actually unfair to the accused who doesn't have a process. And the minute he stepped down, uh, Judge Kaczynski short-circuited having an investigation of the allegations against him. There was no meaningful process investigating Brett Kavanaugh. And so I think one of the things I cite to in the book is conversations that I have uh, with Anita Hill, who, you know, everyone now says, oh, I believe her. And she is sort of a, a hero and a prophet. And all she wanted was not to be believed. She just wants structural reform. Right, right. You write a lot about your conversations with her. And I, I just love it. And the conversations that you also write about the conversations that she had with Christine Plasia Ford, which I didn't know existed, but apparently are on podcasts. And I, I want to go listen to them. But what did you, what did you learn from Anita Hill? Because you, you've taken a lot of lessons and inspiration from her. And she's asked you to speak at things. You have asked her to speak at things. What 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 would you say you've learned from her and, and your relationship with her? I mean, she has been, um, you know, I, I probably uh, was one of those people who watched every second of her testimony at the time. And it very much shaped at the time how I thought about Clarence Thomas and how I thought about um, the confirmation process and how I thought about the ways in which Clarence Thomas in his own autobiography kind of created an enemies list of it, you know, of all these women who are out to get him and what it means to have lifetime tenure. And, you know, to quote now Judge Kavanaugh, who then becomes Justice Kavanaugh, you know, to be told you're going to reap the whirlwind uh, for coming forward and surfacing these claims. And so I think th there's a big Anita, Anita Hill-shaped 
um, you know, uh, shadow over how I think about everything in terms of the law. But maybe the deepest thing, and it goes back to where you started, Pete, which is she is one of those people and different folks in this book land in different places who's really bullish on using the law with all its failings to bring about democracy and peace and, and, and dignity and privacy. And, you know, there are some characters in the book, Becca Heller, I'm thinking of, who essentially says, of course, the law is inherently biased for white men and property owners. It basically sucks. It's the only game in town. You know, I'm using the master's tools uh, to dismantle the master's house. Anita Hill is not that. She is really an institutionalist and she is very, very committed to using the law, even with the understanding and the caveat that it has been the instrument of women's oppression and Black women's oppression, particularly in this country, uh, for centuries. And so I think one of the things that Anita Hill does for me, and I was at an event this week in Charlottesville with my friend Amy Woolard at the ACLU, who said the same thing, is to be reading a book and have Anita Hill be the clarion voice for, no, the law has done amazing things, right? The law has done Brown v. Board, the law has done Obergefell, the law has given so much in a really compressed amount of time. And it's not perfect, but the alternative, Anita Hill says in the book, is chaos and violence. And that's unacceptable. And so for me, I think all of the women toggle back and forth between, you know, having grievous doubts about whether the law is the thing to save us. But Anita Hill just lands squarely in the place that I think I am, which is there's no plan B. If we lose the rule of law, it's just, you know, everybody's Yosemite Sam, boo, 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 boo. You know, it's guns, it's vigilantism, <laughs> it's power. And um, as I said in my chapter about Charlottesville, because I lived in Charlottesville when the Nazis and white supremacists marched, I'm not, I'm a little chunky and a little slow. Like I'm not going to be winning any like ninja street battles, but I really think that what I can do and what women should do is lash themselves to the force of law and the rule of law, because I think that in shaping it and all sort of helping to bend it, as you said at the very beginning, we've had huge wins that we don't always really reckon with. And also you're not a violent person as evidenced by your your choice to use a cartoon sound effects. And, and even <laughs> character, when in fact you've written about the real life <laughs> menaces throughout this book, uh, including in, in Charlottesville, which I, I want to get to. But before I get to Charlottesville, and I think it's Robbie Kaplan, the lawyer there, right? Uh, it's I, You mentioned Becca Heller in Chapter 3, the airport revolution of your book, which if people haven't bought Lady Justice this point into our conversation, much less into Dahlia's press tour, then you got to go get it right now and share it with your sons and daughters. Uh, but you talk about uh, what happened just at the very beginning of the Trump administration with the Muslim ban and uh, and what was going on with the chaos at the airports. And in step, the co-founder of the International Refugee Assistant Project, who was only 35 years old, Becca Heller, and you introduce her, us to her and so many other lawyers. Tell us about her story and why you included her in Lady Justice. Becca, first of all, is just an amazing character. She, you know, I urge people to to Google her and watch her speak. She's one of the most inspiring young lawyers I've ever met. And I included her in part because, you know, the Muslim ban, less than a week into the administration, this just landed with a thump. And a lot of people were shocked and a lot of people were paralyzed. And Becca just turned on a dime and did something about it. And she essentially helped organize that thing that we saw play out at airports all around the country, where you had refugees who had valid visas. You, know, you had students who were returning from vacation, you know, people who thought when they got on the plane that they had a lawful permit to enter the United States, some of whom had sold all of their earthly possessions because they were coming here to be resettled. And all of them suddenly become stateless in the air. Right. And folks, I think, forget two things about that. One, how just utterly cruel it was 
that it was really viciously cruel. It's the Adam Serwer, the cruelty is the point thing, where yeah. you have people who have nowhere to go, who are being now held at airports, told like, sorry, uh, that permit you had, that visa you had is no longer legal. But also, and I love this part of the story, that the lawyers are the heroes, right? Because if you think back to what was going on at SeaTac, at JFK, at LAX, lawyers just swarmed the airports, held up signs, started filing pro se, like filings on behalf of, of refugees and immigrants. And we're just like, I, I, I quote the lawyers standing outside SFO Pete, just chanting, let the lawyers in, let the lawyers, because it's like, when are we ever the good guys? You know, like everybody wants us at the bottom of the ocean. But these lawyers who <laughs> showed up were like, tax attorneys and like trust in the yeah. states people yeah. and real estate people. And they just showed up. And for me, I love the chapter and I love Becca's work organizing it. She essentially, and this is what she's been doing for years, kind of gets volunteer lawyers to help refugees because you're exponentially more likely to get status if you have a lawyer leading the way. And she'd been doing that for many years, but she becomes instrumental in what I called this airport revolution. And I love the chapter both because <laughs> Becca's sort of standing at the airport in ripped jeans and a hoodie on national television, confessing like she thinks she might have written the first line of her obituary <laughs> because this is yes, crazy, right. but also because lawyers were amazing and they were incredible and they were heroes. And again, that's the energy that I want people to take away from this book, which is it doesn't matter <laughs> who you are. If you showed up then at the airports, show up now, whether it's for, um, you know, refugees or whether it is for migrant teens or LGBTQ, you know, teens in your community, like we can change the world and we can use the law to do it, but we just have to just have the kind of leaders that I think Becca is. Yeah. I felt that way throughout the book, uh, that we can change the world using the law to do it. Cause you, you state that in different places. I'd li and now like to announce, cause I just thought of it while you were talking here that so many of these women that you, you document that you talk about, I've looked into and followed on Twitter and I have like, I've decided to announce I'm going to do it. Com is it compendium? Is that the word compendium? Uh, a partner series that is going to be uh, uh, connected to Lady Justice. It's not sanctioned by you or your publisher, Penguin. Uh, but I'm going to try to interview every single one of these women who are still living, including Anita Hill. <laughs> Uh, is as a, and tie it all back to what I learned about them in, in the book. And at the beginning and end of those interviews, make sure that people read Lady Justice because I only learned about them, so many of them, uh, uh, because of this book, including uh, Polly Murray, is that the name? Which is, you're outraged. You are outraged, and I understand you're outraged that we don't really know who she is. She is one of the most unsung American heroes, apparently, ever, and you introduce us to her, and, and, and so important. You've talked about her, written about her. What do you want to say? Who is she? Well, first of all, I think if Polly Murray were alive today, um, uh, she might want to be called they. Oh, right. Uh, because right. Paul, Polly Murray uh, very much throughout her whole life felt that she was a man trapped in a woman's body and there was no language and recognition and support for that. Um, but Polly Murray was this formative American constitutional hero um, that nobody knows about. So the first thing your listeners should do is watch the documentary. My name is Polly Murray. It is incredible. I think it premiered at Sundance a year and a half ago and we had um, the, the two, um, uh, producers uh, on my podcast, Amicus, and I became obsessed with her, Pete, for exactly the reason that you're just saying, which is Polly Murray, as a law school, pick, first of all, can't get into the college of uh, their choice because Black, can't get into the law school of their choice because woman, right? Every single door is slammed. And nevertheless, Polly Murray uh, writes a law school paper that becomes the spine of Brown v. Board, <laughs> that becomes the argument that Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense <laughs> use to uh, desegregate schools. And Polly finds out years later because nobody puts their name on the brief. Nobody credits any of the work. Yeah. And then Polly Murray goes ahead and does essentially the same thing, does like the singularly important work of 
pulling from the 14th Amendment gender equality, at least Ruth Bader Ginsburg credits Polly Murray on early briefs, even though Polly Murray didn't co-write them. Justice Ginsburg is very careful to say these ideas are Polly Murray's, not mine. And the reason I'm totally obsessed with Polly Murray, in mm. addition to the fact that the documentary is amazing, is that this whole book is kind of a meditation on hero culture and who gets famous and who gets mugs made for them and who does work in the vineyards for decades and doesn't get acknowledged. And I think I want to say and challenge me if I'm wrong, that this we've kind of arrived at a cultural moment where we think if we just buy enough RBG tote bags or enough, you know, um, advent candles with Bob Mueller on them or whoever the savior du jour is, that we're doing the work of democracy repair. And I think that that's just so myopic. I love RBG. I love Bob Mueller. You know, I really do believe that our, we need our heroes. And one of the reasons some of the heroes in the book are not familiar to you is that I think they're all around us. And so I'm obsessed with Polly Murray because in a fair and just fame culture, Polly Murray would have been given their due. And uh, because Polly Murray was not, I think that we have to be really, really mindful of who gets credit and who's out there every day, all day doing the work and never gets credit and is working in huge communities of other people not getting credit, and we forget to make the tote bags and the mugs for them. It's an interesting point because of who, who buys things and becomes parts of movements tangentially through a sticker or a tweet versus who does the, the work. And I guess you're more likely to do the work when you lose a right I mean, people tend to wake up more when things happen. You're obviously seeing that throughout throughout the world when it comes to women's rights issues. And with the overturning of, I mean, with, with abortion being outlawed, people keep talking about, including you, you know, Dobbs and the names of the case. I just like to say abortion is outlawed in, I think, 14 states now, most recently Arizona. Arizona. And what do you think, just a, a departure maybe, or you can bring it back to Lady Justice if you want, what do you think that is changing, if anything? I'm not asking you to make a prediction because I know that's everybody's doing that, but it's clearly waking people up in a way that is was hard to predict, maybe. So I think I have two answers, and one of them is, and I think I say this in the book, but I, I learned this from people like Dorothy Roberts and Peggy Cooper Davis. Black women scholars who've been writing about this for years, again, in obscurity. Um, Peggy Cooper Davis, I think, is one of the people who uh, warned us years ago that uh, this was going to happen. Dorothy Roberts warned years ago that if you could start to criminalize pregnancy, you were going to criminalize parenting and that the canaries in the coal mine here are um, African-American women. And so, again, part of the answer is if you were a black woman in the South, you never really had a right to abortion, right? If you were in Mississippi, if you were in Tennessee, if you were in Alabama, you had a paper right to terminate a pregnancy. But between the Hyde Amendment, which made it impossible to fund it, and travel, and uh, having clinics closed all around the country, Dobbs only was a wake-up moment for people who thought that everybody in the country had access to abortion. And so, and, and, and Carol um, Anderson makes the point about voting in the book. If you are for the first time in your life standing in line in Georgia in a pandemic with a water bottle and a battery charger, because that's how you vote now, please understand, she says, that's how black people have voted in this country since they were allowed to vote. Yeah. And yeah. so I think one of the things I want to think about in answer to your question is this leveling, right? Like, oh, it turns out like now all of us don't have the right to abortion, whereas before it was just if you were poor or you were black or uh, you were, you know, uh, a young a young girl who had come from Central America to escape uh, abuse and uh, cross the U.S. Mexico border in September 2017 and uh I mean, I just jumped on you to to jump back into chapter five of Lady Justice Abortion at the Border, where we learn about Brigitte Amiri and more ominously or infamously, we learn about Scott Lloyd, uh, who 
when watching or reading Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, he, he was uh, he was watching for ideas. <laughs> for inspiration. Yeah. I mean, and this is again, I think this is a chapter that ends in triumph in some sense, because Bridget Amiri at the ACLU manages after taking this case all the way up to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, and prevail so that this migrant teen can uh, terminate a pregnancy. Uh, so it's a triumph, but yeah, now we live, we're there again, right? And it's not just migrant teens, but I think it's a really good way of thinking about those who are preyed on by a state that is going to be wildly pro-forced pregnancy, forced birth, are always the vulnerable people, right? I mean, Black women were being uh, sterilized for years in this country uh, without their consent. Uh, so I think, and migrants as well. So I think, again, what I'm hoping is not that the book is so much a book that says, and everything changed with Dobbs, because it was ever thus if you were vulnerable. And the fact that the Trump you know, administration went all the way to the trouble of trying to sanction Bridget Amiri for winning that case, uh, you know, tells you that these women really were, she could have lost uh, her ability to argue before the Supreme Court because they were so angry uh, uh, that she prevailed. But I think that I want this to be a story of this has always been happening. It just was happening maybe to people who didn't look like you. And now it is going to happen, as you said, in 14 states and probably at some point soon in half the states to people who look exactly like you or your daughter or, you know, the pregnant person down the street. And so it is really on us to use the law to push back against that now while we still can. You know, when you talk about the the, the people who know, the people who have had to deal with these issues, the people that didn't need a canary in a coal mine because they were them, it's it, it, and throughout reading the book, I kept thinking about men, especially, and allies or or progressive minded people or white folks or whatever, where we're not so directly affected by so many of the things that you write about here. Uh, I've got two daughters, so I've always tried to look at life through their eyes and advocate for them. But it would seem to me, certainly has been evidence from the activism that I've been involved with, that if the whites, specifically the men, don't do a ton of stuff that puts us in reputational career, friendship, danger, then we won't really have the kind of change because you can't rely just on yourselves and women to understand the law. And seeing as that we're basically the problem, if we're not doing things, you write a lot about your son and your relationship with him. It's a very personal book as well. But I did want to ask, you know, I mean, your, your thoughts on that. What, what do you, what does your soul scream that, that we should be doing? Those of us who aren't directly affected and those of us who are probably a huge role or part of a network who are the actual effectors, the oppressors in, in many ways. What can we do? What should we be doing outside of reading this book and, and, and getting involved? Because we put ourselves in danger. I got in a lot of trouble, a serious trouble uh, with my some of my local activism, which I want to tell you about at some point. I mean, I think you're doing it. You're doing it because you're saying this isn't a book uh, by women for women. You're doing it by saying this is all of our problem, right? And I have, as you say, two sons. And I think that anybody who's having a conversation right now that says, you know, I don't want to send my daughter to a college in a state like Idaho, which now apparently you can't get birth control either in addition to um, uh, reproductive rights. But your son, sorry to say, my son, who I like to think I've raised to be an upstander, can be on the hook in some states for just driving a partner to a clinic or for trying to procure medication abortion in the mail. And, and, and so I guess what I wanna say is anyone who thinks this is only about women, like either doesn't know or love a woman or a person, a pregnant person who's had a miscarriage, who has had a pregnancy loss, who has had a non-viable pregnancy that end in, you know, ends with a, a few minutes of a, a, a terrible suffering for a, a infant that dies. And so I think like we all know those people. My, my husband surprised me um, when Dobbs came down, Pete, by posting uh, somewhere, I think on Facebook or, or somewhere, 
about our miscarriage, which he had never written about. And uh, he just sort of publicly stepped into it and said, this was what it was like to have to get a DNC. And this is what it would be like today in Charlotte's Virginia, in Charlottesville, Virginia, if, uh, you know, young Kim gets his way. And so I think this affects all of us. And we have made a terrible mistake in the media by having all women panels talk about Dobbs after it came down. I mean, I think that we really have to do a better job of saying to our male allies, which is why I was so happy uh, to, to name check Eric Siegel, like, thank you for showing up for us. But yeah. also, even if you don't have daughters, even if you've never had a miscarriage, like this will affect you in every single way. And maybe the last thing I'll say, because I'm obsessed again with these Black women historians who've been writing sometimes, you know, without any credit, that they would be the ones who would tell you that these rights that Sam Alito brushes away, right, the 14th Amendment, substantive due process, you know, the right to bodily integrity and privacy and to determine the family of your choice. And he says, oh, that's just a bunch of made up, you know, cotton candy stuff. That is the very right that allows all of us to raise our children, to educate our children. That is the right that the people who are objecting to critical race theory are leaning on, right? If you value your privacy in the most essential ways, then having him kick the legs out from under it affects you too. And so I think we can't set the aperture so narrowly that we're just talking about women and abortion in Mississippi, because this is all of us, our bodies, our freedom, and our ability to have the kinds of families that we choose. Well, I got a little emotional there when you started talking <laughs> because I realized that I'm talking to you and you've done such important work. And I think this book is the most important thing you've ever done, if I do say or say so. But but I I, I think that as I keep coming back to certain works, obviously Michelle Alexander, I think I think a lot about that book, The New Jim Crow, because I think or I thought I, and still think I am as thoughtful and, and sensitive as I can be about uh, racial issues, uh, uh, racial injustice specifically. And, and a lot of that is because I am so many people in my life that I'm so close with that have dealt with that. And so I've heard their stories intimately and personally. And certainly the case, of course, is true with women. And so you think that because you work, in my case, with a lot of different organizations that advocate for women and so on, that that you understand the struggle. And, and my advice is always, you know, listen, if you're a guy, listen. But I think what your book is doing is it's documenting the things as sensitive as you want to be, as you're trying to be about the injustice of uh, that, that marginalized communities and individuals deal with every day in this country in different ways, as thoughtful as you want to be, as woke as you try to be. There are just things you don't know exist legally both problems and solutions. And throughout the book, you're pointing to all these things that I didn't know existed. I didn't know it. Yeah, and it's great. I mean, I think, you know, for those of us who feel like we're just screwed, right? Because <laughs> there's gerrymandering and the court's about to, you know, gut section two of the Voting Rights Act and it sucks. And the independent state legislature theory, you know, have er Eric on to explain it. It's a yeah. nightmare. All this stuff is really bad. But you know what Robbie Kaplan does in Charlottesville? She and Karen Dunn dig up the KKK Act, right? Yeah. <laughs> they dig up a piece of legislation that basically says you cannot, um, you know, commit, uh, organize to commit racial violence. And it's not been used <laughs> since, you know, the Klan was originally the can Klan. It's used a little bit in the 60s. There are instrumentalities here. I think that's what you're saying, right? That every single one of these people manages to find, even though it's sometimes a struggle, they manage to find a hook and they win, right? Robbie, it takes four years, but Robbie Kaplan and Karen Dunn get a $26 million judgment a year ago against the Nazis and, and white supremacists in Charlottesville. And by the way, the Klan Act is now being used you know, to, to prosecute January 6th. Uh, insurrectionists. So I think that what you're saying is so important. You know, th there is a way in which we keep saying, you know, oh, you know, uh, uh, women are like out there and they're protesting. No, they're doing so much more. They are using finely honed, brilliant legal minds to change systems. And it's not 
again, I don't want to disparage women protesting. I want to say the badass woman who went around in Michigan and got signatures for a ballot initiative. That's not just, you know, women's voices. That's women's power. And I think that, you know, when you hear and I and this does make me crazy after Dobbs, you will occasionally hear, you know, our, our good male allies saying, well, this will really goose the vote in November because women are going to be pissed. Like we're actually not transactional humans, right? Like we're not there to goose your vote. We're there to organize and to bring you along and to like support you as you support us. And so I think one of the things that you're you're holding on to is a thing that I really wanted to put at the very center of the book, which is there are very smart people working on gerrymandering reform. There are brilliant people working on the Electoral College and the Electoral Count Act. There are brilliant people working on massive structural court reform. And so to say, like, we have to invent, like, God, I wish there was some mechanism to fix this. There are. We have to be a part of that. And that's not, I think, a gendered thing. I don't think it's a, a race thing. I think that brilliant, brilliant people are trying to do structural democracy reform, they're everywhere. And those are the people we have to find. And those are the people we have to lift up because it's just not good enough to say women are pissed. Yeah, but everybody has to be on the boat and and paddling. You have to do some paddling. And it's just so easy not to. It's so easy not to. But I I encourage people to because when, you know, and, and when I've gotten involved, I've made like Lots of new friends and learned a lot and have in, in my community. So it's actually been been wonderful being in involved and just being a supporter of, of somebody else's movement. Can I read you the epigraph? One is is from Please. Polly Murray. Um, Polly Murray, in addition to everything else, was this phenomenal poet. But then the second one is from Pete Seeger and it's for you, Pete. <laughs> it says this, I'm not sure if my involvement in causes, benefits, marches and demonstrations has made a huge difference, but I know one thing, that involvement has connected me with the good people, people with the live hearts, the live eyes, the live heads. And I, it's the reason it's at the front of my book and this is my friend, um, Barry Friedman, um, who uh, in Oklahoma, who's been doing amazing work too. And the reason that that quote is there is to make exactly the point you just made, which is, you know, I spent four years marching. I marched and I, you know, did within the bounds of what the, the you know, uh, journalistic ethics at Slate enabled me to do. But I meet amazing people. And they, you know, again, I think we just get very, very hung up on which hero is going to come save us, like which hero is going to come save us. And those like live heads, live hearts that you've met, they're, they're everywhere. They're um, everywhere. I love that. I'm, I'm so glad you read that. And I, I love that quote. I read that at the very beginning of the book. And I was, I said, oh, I met that guy. I met Pete Seeger for like three minutes. And what I remember about meeting him, it was backstage at Colbert, you know, how uh, that is. And I just had, him you know bumped into him literally and he made me t much taller than me he made me feel like really important for three minutes he just saw me and asked about me and it was it was wonderful but the quote that really has moved me over the years uh was i remember where i was when i read this just brief section from dr king's letter from a birmingham jail which really motivated me i was going in to give a talk too it was a good thing i was doing but he, he said you know something like the uh warning about the white moderate being the biggest barrier towards social justice. He said, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. And I'm like, I mean, granted, I'm a very progressive guy and so on, but still I was like, he's talking about me. <laughs> he's, I'm the barrier and people like me are. So we, we should do stuff. We should do stuff like as much as we can. We, we should do stuff and we should know that Again, Carol Anderson, the historian uh, in Georgia, has reminded me time and again, as has Professor Hill, that like these are cycles, right? That there's always two steps forward 
and a step back. And we were very blessed, you and I, <laughs> to have lived largely in a time when we just felt like we were surging forward. We weren't even taking two steps. We were leaping and bounding and we had a black president. And, you know, it was uh, the book starts with, um, you know, an abortion uh, argument, oral argument at the court that I covered in 2016 that I just thought was this is it. Women's equality has arrived. And I really believe that. And we've all slid backwards and it's very dispiriting. But again, most organizers, whether it's unions or LGBTQ rights or trans rights or whatever, will tell you this is the way it works and that it's not a spectator sport. Right? <laughs> it, it only works if we all pick up an oar. And I think that it's easy to be despondent. And I mean, anybody who's listened to my podcast over the last couple of years, like has, you know, my producer calls me broken Tigger because I used to be very bouncy and the Supreme Court has essentially broken me. But I think that there's no problem that doesn't have brilliant people working to fix it. And I think every single person who's pissed off that they are in a gerrymandered state or that, you know, there's a voter ID law or that there's vote caging and vote purging happening that's going to make it hard to vote instead of sort of just looking around and saying, I wish someone was working on this, say, why am I not working on this? Because we can do this. We can do hard things. Yeah, I love that phrase and the podcast. Yeah. Uh, what about you? One question about you. I, I, everybody knows Dahlia Lithwick and Dahlia Lithwick knows everybody. Hillary Clinton is tweeting about your book right now. Every, I mean, you know, Al Franken has you on a show. Mary Trump, you're friends with so many people, friends with genuinely people really like you and <laughs> i think that you are one of the most important people in media and politics and academia and i wonder what you think your role is because this book is so important i see you everywhere and everybody knows you and here's the thing you've always i've known you for a long time and you've always been such an approachable kind egoless person, not necessarily screaming in five second sound bites on TV, but soberly warning us about what is happening. Where do you see yourself going? This book is so important. I have no idea where to put that, um, but I will make it my ringtone, Pete. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I just wonder because you punched out of covering the court after the Kavanaugh hearings. You write intimately about that. And I remember at the time thinking, well, what will we do without her in the room and i'm gratified to see you have been continuing obviously to do, do the podcast you're writing at slate and this book is the pinnacle of many things but but what's next i, I mean i think in a lot of ways not you know being in the room covering the court was a really complicated decision for me and you're you're right i write about why after the kavanaugh hearings it felt like an act of normalization for me to be in that room. But I think what I said in that same piece when I explained that I wouldn't be covering the court the same way anymore is that I thought my beat could change from the Supreme Court to justice. And justice is really different from law, right? <laughs> justice is aspirational. And it's also, I think, the water we swim in and people know what it means. Mm. And so I think what I've really tried to do, particularly in the Trump years, was to broaden out the beat from just writing about you know, this or that court decision to trying to think about this larger machinery of justice and all the ways that, again, you know, there's, I love the Supreme Court press corps, but like, we just don't need that many people in that room, you know, covering that group of people because there are state courts all around the country and federal courts all around the country that have no one covering them, right? State Supreme Courts that have no one covering them. And so I think I want this book to be sort of a love letter to the idea that what happens like in, you know, the state court down the street from you is as essential as what happens in the Supreme Court. Oh, they only nice. hear a couple yeah. dozen, you know, cases a year. Yep. And I think it's important what, what happens, not just at Mar-a-Lago, but what's happening, you know, with the carceral system and our death penalty system and, um, all the ways in which there is not justice. And so I guess maybe the answer is, again, it's a, a version of what I said the answer was about activism, which is to look around and say, who's doing this? And 
maybe I should be doing it too. I think it's that, you know, looking around and saying, is there like massive racial disparities in uh, the way justice is administered in my community and the way policing is done in my community? Are there massive uh, gender inequalities uh, in the way that um, uh, 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 we are now policing women's bodies in my community? This is all stuff that we can work on. It really is. But I think that like for me, making like, what I love about what you're saying, Pete, is that the hope for this book was to make that which was invisible and working mm. visible and working better. And so I think that's what I want to do is to keep thinking about, um, you know, the, the the drug court that's doing really good, good work. And the, you know, all of the amazing I had on my podcast, uh, a sentencing judge uh, this year who just talked about trying to bring dignity back to her courtroom. It was one of yeah. my favorite shows of the year. Yeah. So I just think like, let's put in our sort of quiver of arrows, in addition to marching, in addition in, uh, to being angry, in addition to screaming on cable news, let, let's put a whole bunch of arrows that are about justice reform. Yes. And if you don't, nobody will. Is, I'm not talking to you, but you know, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> I really am. Uh, Dahlia, what a great, great, great opportunity to talk to you. This book is the most important book I've read in a very long time, and everybody has to get it and read it and and learn what the truth is about what's going on and what you can do. Thank you so much. I look forward to interviewing everybody that is still living um, that you documented in this book. And maybe I'll talk to those directors of the, of the documentary about Polly Murray, which I'm going to go watch. They're incredible, and that movie will rock your world yeah, because yeah, I yeah. think it's really – for me, again, the people who get famous and the people who don't is a thing we need to think about very hard in this culture. You've really inspired me and relit a fire that had been kind of dormant because I wasn't involved in certain some of these spaces, um, but that I'd, I'd really like to get back involved with. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.